great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And I just want to start off with a big thank you to all of you guys and everyone watching. Uh, this is only possible because of you. So this is three years that in the making here now, and over 750 people have supported this project to make this happen. And we've raised over £90,000 solely through crowdfunding. And that's why we're here and why we can do what we're doing now. So, a um, bit of a different um, uh, presentation, this one, not your typical PowerPoint. Um, we've been here for three years and we've been collecting a huge amount of information and so much of what we do is digital and we've been producing a lot of 3D models um, on different, different scales and I wanted to show you what we've been doing with those models. So, hopefully, me, we can begin to show you what we've got here. So this is the landscape. This is Linda's farm, thanks to Adam Stanford's aerial cam, it's somewhere. Um, flying UAVs, which we'll be doing later on, flying over the island and taking in a lot of information so we can start to map, um, map the area. We can start overlaying geophysical survey on that and really think about targeting our trenches and investigations. Now, this is a really cool tool, it looks really cool. Um, and you can play around with it. You can play around with it as well. Uh, all of this is on, on our website. And you can see where we've been, what we're doing. Um, it's very cool, but there's a kind of serious point to it. There's a lot of people out there who can't be here to kind of experience it in person. So it really brings it to their you know, computer back at home. So people who aren't able to come out and see it can experience it. Now, see. to the trenches, um, I hope you've all had a chance to, to get out there and have a look at them. If not, please do, we'll be there for the rest of today. Um, I want to explain a bit about why we're here. As you may have heard from David Pence yesterday, we're looking for the first monastery that was built here in the 7th century. And that would have been a timber construction quite large, probably taking up much of the island here. Um, most of it we think is under the, the current village here, uh, which means that a lot of it's been lost um, through construction of those later buildings. So we chose an area just next to the priory, the grass, grassy area there, um, in Sanctuary Close, because that's relatively undisturbed. And this <coughs> is one of the trenches that we've got there. Now, um, there's, quite, there's quite a bit going on. Now, the, the landscape has been occupied for hundreds and hundreds of years, so it's trying to pick apart the different layers. And you always start off with the, the latest and you work your way back, kind of peeling the layers off. And we've got quite a lot in there. Um, we've got an Anglo-Saxon graveyard, um, which is very exciting. It's very exciting to have that. Two years ago, when we came in here, we excavated a small trench and um, we found a name stone, a name stone, which is fantastic, along with um, various pieces of disarticulated human remains. Now, we got some of that analysed and that dates to the late 8th to the late 10th century, which is brilliant. It's a nice Anglo-Saxon graveyard. And the headstone, the name stone that came with it, um, here are some of the graves. The name stone here, you might not be able to see this, but it actually has someone's name, and it's Ifrit, which is quite amazing because that name has never been seen before. That's not documented anywhere. We came in, excavated it two years ago, and that's the first time that we're seeing it. That's a personal connection to the past. Um, 
All of these vines, by the way, can be seen in the finds room, the school room. Um, now, we decided to come back and open up the trench, make it a little bit larger, see what's, what else is going on. And we found more human remains, fully articulated skeletons, which we've been able to come in and analyse. We've got up at the top there, on the left, there's a, a male, age 18 to 25, um, and there's a female skeleton down here at the bottom. We're not looking at a graveyard for the monks. This is a kind of lay person. Um, people who'd have been working around the monastery, uh, making it function. There have to be farmers and bankers and you know all of those people. And we opened the trench up again this year and started taking it down and down. And we keep on finding these human remains. Uh, there's a lot that we're going to be able to do with this. We're hoping to do um, analysis on the bones, on the teeth. There's various isotope analysis, strontium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. We can work out where these people uh, lived, grew up, what their diets were. We're going to get a huge amount from this. Now, there's something rather sweet, I think, that happened this year. Um, a couple of years ago, we found a piece of inscribed stone. Um, the, down at the bottom here, and you might be able to see there's a couple of crosses on it. Um, this probably <coughs> dates to about the 8th century, we think, somewhere around there. And it's quite unique. There aren't any other examples from around here. But what's really amazing is that we came in two years later into the trench just a week ago and found another part of it, the same piece which we've been able to fit, fit to it. Now that's been in the ground broken about 10 metres apart from each other for about 1300 years and we finally managed to piece them together after all that time. It's incredible, really. And uh, we found something else that was very, very nice. Uh, Liz, in fact. There's Liz, it's Liz here. Um, amazing find. Um, this is a coin from Ethelred the Second. Now, that's not the Ethelred the Second, the Unready from the South, from the Kingdom of Wessex. We're in Northumbria now. Uh, so, Ethelred the Second, very little known about him. Um, reigned in about, I think, 841 AD. And, I mean, this is tiny, this is smaller than your thumbnail. Uh, we've come in, recorded it in 3D. Please do have a look at these models. I don't, I don't think this does it does them justice. But we've also on the back got the name of the person who minted it, Fordred, probably from York at the time. Again, these names just make it all a little bit more personal, that kind of connection to the past. It's not about the find being amazing, it's about the names that we're starting to, to see and we can say again. And what's really interesting for me, the most interesting thing is where it was, because it was over the top of this, in a rubbly layer. And this is the, the find of the dig, I think. The graves are amazing. We've got some really cool name stones. Uh, I think we've got three, is that right? Three this year. And previously there were only 17 ever found around here. <coughs> but this is what it's all about. This is uh, an 8th century building, which is very rare. Anglo-Saxon buildings, you never find them. Been digging for 15 years. This is the first one that I've had to excavate. It's fantastic. And what you're looking at, you need a bit of, bit of uh, eye of faith and uh, good archaeological imagination, but do you see these lines of stones here going that way? 
that's the footing, the stone footing for a building. And it would have been a timber construction, something kind of rafted on top there. We might have had some post holes in there. There's ovens as well. We've got two in there. Um, one of them looks like it might have been for making lime, for, for mortar. The other one could be a bread oven. That's, that's what we think. Um, now, we got a little bit of a surprise. Um, always get a surprise on the last day of the dig is there's a gap in the wall and we we weren't really sure we we're going to find something to do with the um, the oven but actually we found more graves which is probably no surprise and um, they might be a little bit later more associated with the priory building that we're right next to 12th 13th century um, but we're going to excavate those remains today i hope uh, as it is definitely the last day today um, and it'll give us a nice snapshot into what we've got to look forward to over the next year or two. Um, we'll get a nice sample from that, a sample from the oven. We'll be able to do all sorts of analysis and be able to date these structures. Um, it's very difficult to date features like this, but this gives us our best chance at recovering some remains. So, as we go on, um, the um, we're going to come back out next couple of years, we think. We've, I mean, you can dig this site for a very, um, very long time. There's kind of lifetimes worth of archaeology just in the trenches that we've got. Um, and I mean, we really don't have enough time. Uh, but we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best. We have more than three days. <laughs> um, but what we want to do next year, and kind of building on in the future, is look at the wider landscape, but also investigate more around these buildings. These are so, so rare. We're going we're gonna to extend the trench off to the west, uh, and hopefully, I can convince the bosses, uh, we'll just keep going that way. Um, and see if we've got more buildings, because this is, this is how people lived. And it's all about how people lived. I prefer to concentrate on that than how they died. You can get a lot of information from the graves, but really it's about the buildings where they lived and interacted with other people, and that's what's really interesting um, to us. So, that's, that's where we're at. Um, we've got an awful lot left to do today. Uh, I would encourage you all to come out to the trenches. We, um, we'll have tours out there at, I think, 12 and 3 o'clock. Uh, the finds room is open all the time. All the name stones are in there. If you're interested in the 3D models, all of these have been put together while we've been on the island. And we'll be doing a demonstration with our, our project etched in stone um, out just down the side here, straight after this, I think, 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock. So if you're interested, uh, we want to share this with you, show you how you can do this, uh, create models that you can share with people. Um, and you get, to, you get to handle the artifacts as well. They're, they're, it's incredible, the finds that we've got. I really would encourage you to have a look around and um, get hands on with the archaeology. So, thank you very much. Um, I imagine that some of you may have questions that you want to ask Chris about the archaeology. I, I, I can start, Chris. Yes. Um, you said in that typical uh, archaeologist way, you found a building. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Can you, you know, when you come down on a building, I know like for the first day, you're just going to think, oh, this is a linear feature, oh, oh it's got a turn on it, etc. So, but you must. You must have some kind of guess of what it is. When you're down there, you must have some kind of feeling, even if you have not the proof of it yet. Yes, yeah, it is more of a feeling. I mean, 
it's taken a lot of convincing other people. I think for the first few days it was myself and David Betts who could see it and actually trying to explain this to other people when, I don't know, you, you kind of visualise it, it's a feeling more than actually seeing something there. You mean you, you could, they could just see a few stones and you could see the logic of it being a bit. Yeah, you can see how it would be pieced together, the footings, where the post holes might be, you can kind of visualise how it would have been constructed yeah. in the past. That's, I think that's quite important to have that kind of imagination, to have seen the sites and to experience it, and that's quite a big part of it. And what is it? What's the building? Yeah. The, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's a couple of, uh, there's a, I like to think, there's a couple of ovens there, maybe a little kiln. I like to, you know, everyone needs a bakery, everyone needs bread. Maybe they're doing that. Um, you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. We'll get the samples. We'll get that analysed back in the lab, and uh, we'll be able to tell you. But there. So if there's if there's ovens and stuff there, it's likely not to be solely for church ritual purposes. Is this a no? No, I don't think. To get your hands dirty, place. Yeah, I think so. I don't. It's not industrial scale, but. There's stuff going on. People are people are working there. Yeah. Anybody else got a question? Gentlemen, we've got. Hang on. I, I, I'll get the mic to you because uh, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, because it's being streamed, the people can't hear who are just watching from the other side of the world unless we use the mic. Is there anybody else? Someone can have another mic standing by. Anybody else ask a question? Yes. One up the back of that Oh, and Yes. Chris, my uh, question is basically there was a uh, very consistent layer of rubble on top of it um, across the entire site. What do you make of that? Ooh, the rubble. So, so on top of all of the graves, um, there's a large layer of rubble, which most of our name stones have come from. I mean, this site has been ploughed. There's very faint ridge and furrow across the site. I think it's just a disturbance layer. There's something I didn't mention. There's a large wall in the trench. That's not, well, that's not part of our early monastery. That's a later construction. <laughs> when you say a large point, wall, is that? Yeah, part, there's a yeah. Part, parts of it there. And what, in fact, what's interesting about these bits of wall is that there's plow damage on it. And those stones slowly shifted. So we've got evidence for a building being there, and it's been shifted. Now, the, I, I suspect it hasn't just been the plough that's destroyed that and turned it into rubble. It's been a lot of other things going on. Um, but yeah, um, I suspect ploughing has done a lot of it, and the recutting and constant churning of, of graves being dug and um, kind of movement of soil. So it's not that it's intentional plough. I, sus I suspect not. I suspect it's not, not some kind of clearing event. We're all so sad, aren't we? Stephen said the rubble, and we all went, oh, the rubble. <laughs> 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 Gentlemen, up Morning, Chris. Um, my question is about your, your ovens. And I was interested when I went to look at the finds that there was no evidence there of any mental residues, slags as we archaeologists like to call them. Uh -huh. Nothing really seems to indicate the purpose of them. And I just wondered, given the location and the general association of monastic sites with industry, whether it might be something to do with salt. Salt? Yeah. Um, well, possibly. I, sus I suspect not. I suspect not. Um, I would have thought anything with salt you might find a bit lower down on the site, um, uh, on the, in the landscape even. Um, and they're quite, <coughs> quite small. I think it's more likely that they're kind of small contained ovens um, rather than salt. Salt would have been made, I think, on a slightly larger scale in the landscape um, and possibly even imported. In. You need the right kind of conditions, brackish water, and um, yeah, I suspect it's unlikely. But again, we'll send up the results to the lab and, and see what we come back to. Thank you. I'm just wondering, 
Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned the host holds that are found with an old Anglo-Saxon building. Mm -hmm. Even if this is not the original Cuthbert building, are you hopeful that possibly in this fairly contained area that you might find uh, some post holes or evidence of Anglo-Saxon buildings? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think so. The example that we've got uh, matches perfectly with an example from Harvey Hall, just down the coast. And what they found was that their building, which looks just like ours, um, was actually the second phase of construction. And once they excavated it, they found earlier post holes underneath. Um, so that's what I'm hoping we've got. And, and there's preservation out there, it's perfect. Like I say, it's been ploughed to bits and there's been graves cut everywhere, which has probably removed a lot of the early structural remains. But in that one place on that the building, I think, is our best chance of finding. And is that where you'll be going next year? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Uh, lady there, in the middle, and also one behind her. Is there evidence of the Vikings? The 793. Did they just come through and keep going, or did they stay there? No, nothing no, on the way. No, I think they would have dropped something in the Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're still looking for that something. Um, yeah, there, there isn't. And that, that's the problem with these kind of single events, events in, in history. It's very difficult to find evidence for that one, that one day. Um, yeah, we'll keep looking. We know they didn't hang out there, they just kept going. I think they're just uh, lay people, just people who are, I mean, I imagine they'd have been living here, but we've got from the many bits of disarticulated remains, we've got men, women, children, infants, um, there's, there's, there's all sorts going on. I, I suspect it's the people who are making the monastery function. So there would, there would have been hundreds of people living here back when it was first founded. And only a small proportion, I would have thought, would have been monks. You know, there's a, a large community that has to work to enable the monastery to function. And I think we're looking at a graveyard associated with that. Um, but yeah, we'll, I mean, the, oh, the, the remains, there were two skeletons that I had up before. One of them was a male, 18 to 25, signs of anemia. Um, uh, the other female, aged in their late 20s. Um, and we've had, I think, the one that we're excavating this afternoon is quite an elderly man. There's sign, early signs of arthritis in the back. Quite, quite tall. Um, can't tell you much more than that just at the moment, but the isotope work that Durham University will be doing uh, should tell us a bit more. I think it's a really interesting point about the other people. I always, I've always felt uh, when we've been doing work on, on this side of England, that in some ways we misrepresented it. Uh, Lindisfarne always seems so isolated, so remote, so uh, underpopulated, so far away from where the real action of Great Britain was taking place. But of course, in the uh, 7th, 8th, 9th century, Northumberland was uh, the, the, the intellectual powerhouse of the whole country. And, uh, there wasn't actually an A1 and an M1 and the London to Avenue Railway then, so that was the way everybody was, was coming up the coast. And I think it was Chris who said yesterday that um, this would have been one of the most highly populated areas for, for miles around, rather than how we think of it now, where it's all a bit... <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, Do you think the others are contemporary, contemporaries with the building? Because surely others would have normally been outside, especially the line burning. 
because otherwise it poisons humans. Yes, yes, that's uh, what confuses me about that one. Um, we start to work out what that's for. We're going to be analysing the, the, the residues that's inside. It doesn't make sense to me either, because yes, I'm very bad for you. Uh, and uh, um, so yes, it doesn't quite make sense yet. That, uh, now, the thing is, when we look at a site, it's nice to think that's a site and that's all one episode. But actually, that's so many different phases of activity over different generations and generations, that building might have, uh, that might represent one phase of the construction of the building, we might remove that and find that there's a post-built structure which is associated with a different oven. So we have two ovens, at least two ovens, next to each other. They don't necessarily have to have been working at the same time. I think they are contemporary with one phase or other of the building. Then um, again, we're, we're we're going to have to, have to wait till we get some dates to find out. Anyone? <coughs> Coming up, pick up that. Gentleman on the aisle. I'll take the gentleman just behind you there first, please. So, then we're going to the gentleman on the aisle next. Okay. Thank you. Just wonder if there was any, has been any evidence at all of interregional trade or trade with the other? Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, or possibly with the continent, or international trade, hmm. to stand up at all? Yes, I think uh, David Press would be your, your man for this, but um, yes, I think so. And actually what's quite interesting is the the cross that we've got, those two pieces that fit together, that kind of tradition, that style, isn't from around here, it's from kind of further to the, the northwest, um, outside the, the kingdom. So, I mean, I, I suspect, yes, there would have been quite a bit of trade. Um, but uh, I, think, I think that was for, for David to, to say he's the, the expert on this. Thank you. Gentlemen. How should we know about the, um, the sea level and the plain garden and the kind of land back then? Um, it would have been quite different. Um, you know, as you come over the causeway, you've got those huge sand dunes. Well, quite a lot of those are masking an earlier, uh, or slightly later, I suppose, medieval village. There's a deserted medieval village there. So that's been, that, you know, the landscape has changed hugely since then. Um, I'm told that the sea would have been, or come up slightly higher on the land. Um, so as you walk down by the trenches near to the east of the priory, it kind of dips down and then you've got the harbour, I think. There's a there's a suggestion that the sea level the sea would have come up higher, much closer to the priory. Um, but really, we're doing a, a kind of landscape environmental um, project, taking cores, um, and hopefully we'll be able to work out kind of recreate the landscape because it's not just about our site; it's the environment, the landscape, how the whole thing would have kind of pieced together. It looks quite different, I imagine. It's true with virtually every digger along. Uh, this coast, isn't it? That you rip the first thing that you need to do in order to make sense of it mm. is to work out where the sea was because, sure enough, yes. it ain't going to be where it is now. No, 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 that's it. There's a lot of coastal erosion. If you take a walk on near the causeway, there is archaeology almost falling out of the small cliffs there, so it's you know, it's ever changing. One last question. Uh, I'll Hi, um, you say you found evidence of children with mm. regards to burials. Are they the uh, children of the late people, or do you have evidence of them starting a monastic life from a, a young age? Um, um, we have no, no evidence for, um, e either way, really, it's very difficult to say. I understand that uh, children would have started off uh, in monasteries at a very young age, around the age of seven. Um, but I suspect that as we're looking at a graveyard or cemetery which has men, women and a, a, quite a range, I'd say the, the lay people probably more associated with that. I said uh, it was the last question but it's, it, it's Lisa's party so she's allowed to, she's allowed to ask Chris. I have two questions actually. Oh come on! <laughs> no, no, they're easy ones. Where can people see the models? 
people can see the models by visiting our, our website at digventures.com and clicking on the link for Linda's farm. Um, and all the models are up there. And you can you can look at them on your phone now if you've got got 4G. Yeah, you can have a look at them on your phone, on your computer, anywhere, anytime. Um, yeah, and we it doesn't stop here because we've recorded a huge amount of information. We'll just keep on building on that in the coming weeks and months as we we work our way through the finds. And I saw in a couple of the slides there were little numbers and circles on some of the models. What are those, and where do they go? Right. So, what the three D <coughs> models? So people can see them, move them, interact with them. They are annotated. If you click on those numbers and links, it will take you to our digital recording page, digital digity. Everything that we're doing out here is digitally recorded. We don't go out with paper context cards on sites anymore, I'm afraid. Um, everything is digital, and it's all linked to this. If you click on a link, from a, a skeleton in a grave there, it will take you to the recording sheet online straight away. You can read, you can see photos um, and other 3D models that are linked to it. It's a relational database that we've got. So it's, and it's changing by the minute. I'd imagine it's changed now from how it was when I started speaking, because they're out there recording now. Um, so you can interact with the dig in that one. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks.